I'm actually a little embarrassed to admit it, but it's what comes to mind is the first thing I should say on this, this show, which is me about uh, avoiding poverty and perhaps the flip side, doing okay financially. Um, you know, you, I like to think that I was <clears throat> born to be a you know a researcher, an intellect, a public intellectual. But piece of me, a piece of me thinks that I was kind of meant to be just like my father, kind of this. Uh, um, kind of responsible small business guy who knows about how to, uh, you know, how to live modestly and therefore not feel under financial pressure, how to uh, make money reasonably, how to spend it, invest it, so as to not go broke. And these days, you know, even apart from COVID, there's a hell of a lot of people who used to be in the middle class who now fear, um, being having to descend from the middle class and even be homeless. You know, the cliche is about being a bag lady. Uh, so I want to share my thoughts, uh, whether I was meant to be great with money or, or not. These are my best best thoughts on um, on money and how to make the most of it. Uh, let's start with, uh, I think what really starts is, is just generally a parsimonious mindset toward money. The, the amount of pleasure you get out of purchases beyond the minimum are small. Um, that certainly applies to designer labels rather than mainstream brands. Designer labels cost so much, not because they're better, but because it's so much spent on advertising mainly. Occasionally they're better, but rarely enough to justify the cost. Um, and in fact, very often it's the mainstream brands, those that are, that are sold at uh, you know, in, in Walmart or the mainstream, you know, cars like a Toyotas or mainstream appliances like Whirlpool, uh, the mainstream um, cosmetics, the mainstream brand name foods, uh, you know, are those companies because they'll make more net profit by selling the zillion units at a moderate price to the mass market than a smaller number of products to the, to the ultra wealthy. They can afford to hire the very best developers to for developing those products. So paradoxically, and that's true of many restaurants as well, that the best recipes are going to be not in your frou-frou restaurant um, where they're serving 20 meals a day, but, and you're going to hate me for saying this, but from chain restaurants where they, you know, where they can hire somebody, for example, at uh, Olive Garden, the chef who designs the recipes at Olive Garden, is going to be making recipes for millions of people so they can afford to pay him or her maximum dollars. And therefore, the, it's more likely to be better for you, better tasting and going to cost you a hell of a lot less than going to La Frufru for dinner. So the first thing is to have this mindset that you, you know, the, we often hear the phrase, you can't spend your way to happiness. That's absolutely correct. Beyond a bare, you know, roof over your head, basic health care, basic food, you know, basic transportation, right. But beyond that, the additional benefit that you get is really small and therefore key to, if you're worried about, you know, descending from the even bare middle class into poverty or homelessness, the most important thing you can do is recognize that spending beyond the basics, both in terms of the quantity of basics, whether you're buying luxury items or simply buying brands that are expensive, let alone fancy jewelry, you know, diamonds rather than cubic zirconium, uh, you know, five-star vacations rather than staying at a, you know, a local <clears throat> motel or cabins or whatever. Individually, those don't change your life, but a collective mind, a mindset that, that thinks in terms of how much pleasure you get for the money expended and for the freedom that you're denied by having to make a lot of money. Because if you're making a lot of money, usually means you've got to be doing work that isn't your favorite work to do because otherwise employers wouldn't have to pay you so much. You know, For example, companies pay corporate lawyers a lot because it's very contentious, sometimes dishonest. Uh, and you're doing work that doesn't necessarily feel rewarding, you know, when you're fighting 
to negotiate some contract details so that one corporation can make a little more money than the other corporation, that doesn't exactly feel soulful. So my point is, the first step toward avoiding homelessness, feeling secure financially, is to realize that beyond the bare minimum, spending modestly is wise. And again, you know, for example, I drive, I've been driving Toyotas for years. I can afford anything, to be honest with you, but any kind of car, I mean. Um, and yet I buy moderate Toyotas, like you're, I, I'm just a basic Prius, which costs 22000 bucks, new. Um, and I keep it until it drops, usually 300,000 miles, because, and I've had about 10 Toyotas, they've all lasted that long, because Toyotas are, again, they are the ultimate mainstream brand, so they get the best engineers, designers, the best processes. And that gives me a lot of freedom. Part of why I've made money is that I've been able to, by spending modestly, in all the things that I've mentioned, I then am able to invest carefully and simply without being a sucker for the, the avaricious types that will try to get your money. I think I'll move right to that since that seems to be coming up right now in this conversation. I'll recall an example of two, two stories I want to tell you um, that set me to the path to investment righteousness. I'll start with my father when I was a teenager. He's, he got very excited about what then was a new innovation called the mutual fund, where you basically you invest in, uh, in a, a share of stock, but it's not one stock, it's divided across many stocks so you get diversification. And the, the pioneer in that was Vanguard. And he told me about this thing called Vanguard Wellington Fund. And I blew it off because, you know, as a teenager, I was making money because I was a pianist, but I blew him off because he was my dad. But I later came to realize that was really smart. And part of why I came to realize that is I did make good money as a pianist in New York. And um, back then, you know, a complete ignorant person, I was 18, 19, I heard about Merrill Lynch. So I went, in these days, you, would, you wouldn't email or call, you would go. This was back in around 1968 or nine. I walked into the Merrill Lynch office and I got a, they gave me this broker. And in the end, and this was before the era of, of cheap tuition, uh, cheap transaction costs, you know. Um, this guy kept telling me, buy, buy, sell, sell. And each time we'd make a couple hundred bucks or a hundred bucks on, on the transaction. And I ended up losing a fortune because, you know, no, nobody has a crystal ball. And then I came, so I came back then to my father's recommendation about Vanguard, which turned out to be amazingly good advice because even today, half century later, more. Uh, Vanguard remains maybe the, the, the best good guy in the industry. Their fees are 80, 90% cheaper than anybody else. They specialize in mutual funds and their equivalent, which I'm not gonna go into detail here, called an ETF. So that you're paying a fee of, on average of like one-tenth of one percent to get incredible diversification one-tenth of one percent per year. Uh, and it's a huge company, they're not going to run away with your money. And running away with your money brings me to the other anecdote I want to tell you. My wife was working with a guy and a number of people in the uh, California State Department of Education. And a number of them had invested with this investment advisor who showed videos and whatever of amazing returns, 20% a year or whatever it was. And they all invested. And so my wife asked me to go and visit this guy. This was probably around 1990. So we go visit, and first thing, you know, I, I, we get there, this is just this little office in, a, in Sacramento. And he shows me the video, quite slick, which made me nervous. And again, he was just this one guy. I later found out, and I said, but you know, there's something that feels wrong about this guy. He's just not that impressive. These returns, you know, if they're offering 20% in an era where uh, uh, CDs or uh, uh, mutual funds are averaging 7%, he, he can't have this magic, this magic secret. And I said, let's forget about it. Well, six months later, we hear he ran away with everybody's money. And it was just a Ponzi scheme. And uh, so 
being the biggest investment I, advice I can give you. And I'm not a finan licensed financial advisor, so please, as they say, you know, use your own judgment or see a professional. But many, many financial experts will agree that Vanguard is the good guy. They offer a wide range of products from more risk-oriented, that is, more aggressive stocks, to very safe, which is like even government bonds, tax-free bonds that are quite safe. Nothing is guaranteed in life, but pretty damn safe. Um, you could do far worse than to do the following. Every time you have an extra chunk of money, it could be as little as 50 or 100 or 500 or 1,000 in your checking account, decide that you're going to invest that and invest it in whatever Vanguard offering best suits your personality. I personally invest in the Vanguard Index Growth Fund. It's basically the S&P 500, but it's, which means the 500 biggest companies in America, but it's weighted. The ones that have done the best over a recent period of time get the biggest investment. And I believe that with so much information available to the public, the general overall public, that those companies that are doing well, people are putting their money where their mouth is, and I'd rather bet with them. Now, I, I know, and this may be a little bit in the weeds, but um, in the past, uh, what are called growth funds, which is what I've just described, those who are growing, have performed equally to what are called value funds, those that are perceived as undervalued. But, but with ever more information widely available, I'm betting, and it is a bet, that moving forward we will do better investing in growth funds like Vanguard Index Growth Fund. I think VWO is one of the symbols, or VIGAX is another, uh, rather than a, a value mutual fund or a individual stock that's been going down because you say, oh, it's so low, it's going to you know, come back. Walter Buffett, Walter Buffett uh, Warren Buffett uh, famously said, never catch a falling knife, meaning never, never invest in what's been going down. It's more likely to continue to going down, or the way I would put it, an object in motion tends to stay in motion and in the same direction. Um, so uh, the only other thing I want to say about investing is because our tax rate is high and getting going to be getting higher under the current, let's just say, zeitgeist, um, it is normally wise to take advantage of tax-deferred um, um, plans like 401ks, or if you work for a nonprofit, 401bs, or you have something called a 457. That enables you to not pay tax on income that you're making from your employer, or if you're self-employed, there's something called a SEP IRA, and um, not pay tax on anything until you sell it, so uh, or any of the interest or the dividends. So you can, instead of paying tax each year, y your money continues to earn money because it's, it's there's this compounding which, in investing, meaning you're, let's say you, you have a, a dollar dividend. Instead of having to pay tax on it, that de dollar dividend gets reinvested in that mutual fund and continues to make more money. So it's really wise to where you can, unless you really need the money, you know, then you want to keep a certain amount in a mutual, you know, in a uh, money market fund or something so you can really access it right away. Like, but um, where you have some discretionary income you don't think you're going to need for a while, first funding your 401k or 403b, in my opinion, again, not as a professional, just as a personal person who invested his money this way, into a Vanguard mutual fund that matches your risk tolerance, uh, and um, uh, and don't try to time the market. You can't. It's really almost really you know million dollar a year earners who are in the financial services business can't trust to time the market. So the smartest thing you normally can do is to do what is called dollar cost average. That is, every time you've got an extra fifty, hundred, five hundred bucks, whatever you've got extra, decide that that day you're going to invest it in whatever, say Vanguard investment, or you know other people invest in Schwab products or, or fidelity but generally the uh, for sure the lowest fees are vanguards in you know across their entire portfolio so don't try to time the market if you do just buy it that day your money goes to work for you right away and you're going to be buying more shares when the price is low and fewer when it's high because you're just buying it that day so uh, let me try to explain that 
let's say a stock is ten dollars today and you have a hundred dollars it means you're going to get ten shares if a week from now it goes up to eleven dollars you're only going to get nine shares so you actually buy more get more shares when prices are low when you don't try to time the market and if you happen to have that money available when the price is 11 you're going to get fewer shares so you're buying more shares when prices are low so anyway when i come back uh, i'm going to talk some uh, talk about earning money and smart ways to earn money uh, other than investing uh, so uh, just be a 10 minute break 10 minute break <laughs> 10 second break i hope you'll stay with me Thank you for staying with me. Um, we're talking how to avoid poverty, homelessness, or the flip side, uh, how to do well financially without what I'd say is called being a pig. Or because the more avaricious you are, the greater the risk you'll lose money. And so many people who are rich find themselves sitting in their uh, fancy houses and their fancy clothes, drinking their Chardonnays, um, wondering is that all there is? So I am definitely a fan of. Uh, the non-materialistic simple life um, so now I want to talk about earning I, I suppose that I am a fan of the uh, the Bill Gates school uh, which is he earns money where there's money to be made and he found software being his example but then he gives away a ton of money to charity I like that you know if you end up working for a nonprofit that pays you crap you're going to get paid so little and you're not going to have much you're going to be struggling just to survive um, and have nothing to give to charity and um, so often because we live in an era in which there's tremendous valuing of nonprofit values and so there's a million people who want to work for these nonprofits I should say instead of be let me be more accurate there are many more people who want to work for a nonprofit than there are jobs available let alone good paying jobs so supply and demand means that those nonprofits, if they care about giving to the cause, are going to pay workers the, as little as they can get away with. And because there's so many people applying, that's pretty damn little. Or so often, just have them work as volunteers. So in terms of earning money, it may be smart to work in a field where it pays well, as long as you're remaining ethical. And that gives you then the freedom to either work less hours, to donate money to charity. Uh, so I'll talk about a few well-paying careers that, that I kind of like. So, you know, it's easy for me to uh, tout a career that pays well if you have to, if it requires a zillion years of school, like doctor or lawyer. But salesperson is it's not about your degrees it's how well you can understand the product how well you can explain it how well you can build a relationship while remaining ethical and so if you can find a product you really believe in you might do very well as a salesperson as long as you can live with the fact that you are largely and not live with maybe you'll love the fact that you're going to get paid more based on your performance You'll probably get a very little initial salary or no salary, but you're going to be paid on commission. Typically, you'll get paid for the first few months on, with a base salary <clears throat> to give you time to build up clientele, and then you'll be that that base will shrink to zero, and you're going to make all your money on commission. If it's a good product, which you, I, I, I ask that you insist on that, and a fair commission schedule, a reasonable territory. And you sell completely ethically. You're going to, not going to be the best salesman. You're not going to win <clears throat> salesman or salesperson of the month because, it's, unfortunately, salesperson of the month usually does cut ethical corners or often does. But, you know, be completely ethical. Describing the pros and cons of a given product, when it's inappropriate for them to buy, if there's a better choice, telling them. And don't expect reciprocity. They probably won't, but you'll sleep well at night you'll feel good and you'll you'll make enough money so one option for people who are not going to have a zillion degrees but want to make decent money is sales or it's nonprofit analog fundraising um, 
Another way to make money that I, I like is one of my very favorite careers is program evaluator. And here I, I'm walking my talk. My PhD is in, in program evaluation, evaluation of innovation, um, whether it be in education or whatever the innovation is. Um, it's a wonderful field because every, certainly every government funded program, nonprofit funded program, many corporate programs need to be evaluated to see whether the program should be continued, expanded, revised. That's very pro-social. It's making a big difference, and it's fun. It's different. You're getting to see new innovative um, uh, programs and products all the time. And yet it's an under-the-radar career that pe most people don't know about it. And it pays certainly, you know, depending upon how good you are. You know, like in every field, there's this uh, distribution. The average may be 70000 a year. I don't know. I made that up. But there'll be some will make next to nothing, and some will make three hundred thousand a year. It's going to depend how good you are, who you're working for, luck. Um, but I love that career, a program evaluator's way of making money. Um, let me see. I'm just going to give one more example of a way to make money ethically, good money. Um, well, this is the rule. The normal rule is to make money, you've got to uh, make other people money. You got to follow the money. So yes, being in the investment world can indeed help you make money. But again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I've seen too much sleaze or at least overcharging in the financial services industry because most people, I'll say most, not many people in the, who enter careers in the financial services industry are not motivated by altruism but making money. And so there's this temptation for them to overcharge, under, under disclose. And Vanguard I have found to be an absolutely ethical good guy. And so you know, and I'm sure, I'm not sure, I don't know, but I, I have a good strong suspicion that people at Vanguard, um, at least after a while, make a good living. And, you know, without ethical compromise. I have never spoken to a Vanguard rep who's been anything other than ethical. Never. They're not the brightest people in the world either. Uh, forgive me for saying this if you're a Vanguard person, but these are not people who graduate from Harvard or Yale. They generally graduate, they're based in Pennsylvania, and they're generally people who graduate from second or third tier universities, including even the people who are their portfolio managers. But their performance has been excellent because of their low fee structure so customers don't get screwed. And because their people are not on commission, you get to, you trust them. So. That's going to be the third area that I would talk about, ways to make money ethically. So just to summarize, we've talked about all three of the core things you need to do in order to avoid being descending into poverty, being homeless, and maybe even doing well. Number one is the mindset that you're not going to spend your way into contentment beyond the bare minimums. And buying mainstream products is, like, is a no liability way to get better quality of life because in general, the, as I said, the developers of mainstream products from restaurants to, to cars, their net revenues provided that those, that those products create to the company are much higher than high-end products. And so those companies can afford to hire the best people to develop them, and therefore you are going to reap the benefits in terms of the quality of a Toyota, the quality of, of a Whirlpool product, the quality of a chain restaurant like an Olive Garden. So spending modestly, uh, and then in terms of investing, I am now, by the way, I want to make clear, I am not paid by anybody to endorse anything. Not Vanguard, not Toyota, not Whirlpool, nobody. You are, one thing I can promise you, you're getting my ethical truth, affected by nothing other than what I believe is best for you, period. So. Uh, yes, investing, as I believe, is wise in, in the right Vanguard mutual fund or ETF or other product that they have that is, uh, matches your risk tolerance and, you know, you're entitled to your guesses. Are you, are, are you betting on China's future? Then invest in Vanguard's emerging growth fund. It's heavily China. Uh, if, you're, if you're a believer in big companies, American companies, yes, you might try what I invested in VWO or VIGAX, one is, VWO is the ETF version, VIGAX is the mutual fund, um, that's two in the weeds, but they're functionally similar, very similar. Uh, if you're very conservative, they've got a wonderful, they've got Vanguard all-in-one funds, they've got something, uh, 
call the uh, life strategy funds, and they've got a conservative portfolio, a couple of moderate risk portfolios, and a riskier portfolio. You can invest in the conservative portfolio. They have a, a, a wide range of options for you. And then in terms of earnings, you know, you can choose to focus on a cause and therefore probably pay, get paid very little or even be forced to volunteer. Or you can use the Bill Gates model, work where the pay is pretty good, and that usually means following the money in some way, like working for an investment company. Or, you know, as I said, program evaluators, part of why they get paid reasonably is because they're mandated, they're required, they're ubiquitous, and yet it's an under-the-radar career, so many people don't know about it. Great field, right? Uh, you know, and then again, I mentioned sales, because it doesn't require advanced degrees. It just requires that something I don't have, that ability to, to seem relaxed, uh, not be pushy, stay ethical, be resistant to, uh, to not fear rejection and be resilient to it. But selling a great product ethically is another way to make great money even if you don't have a lot of formal education. Anyway, those are my thoughts on how to avoid poverty, certainly homelessness, uh, no guarantees of course, and um, maybe even live better. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I'm Marty Nemco. Uh, I do welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments, and especially like it if you share on your <coughs> share on your so share this on your social media, so that my efforts can have broader impact. Uh, and I, of course, I am honored if you subscribe to whether it's this YouTube channel if you're watching it on YouTube or uh, subscribe to my podcast, my How to Do Life podcast if you're listening to this on Spotify or or iTunes. Uh, in any event, I, I do thank you for watching or listening. I am Marty Nemco.